Christy Gustafson and Barletti with Times Union and TimesUnion.com. And welcome to 20 Things Plus, where we catch up with someone previously featured on the Times Union's 20 Things You Don't Know About Me. Today, we are joined by Jamie Ortiz. Jamie owns several restaurants in the Capital Region, including Toro and 677 Prime. Hi, Christy. So I like when you and I first talked for your original 20 things, I had actually reached out to you because it was the beginning of the pandemic and restaurants were shutting down and I kind of wanted to learn how you were handling all that. So we're going to talk in a little bit about what you, how you developed and what you did during that time. But we'll start with you updating two of your original 20 things and then we'll get into a few new things afterward. Okay? okay. So when you gave us your original list, you talked about how you were really big into cycling when you were a kid, right? And you were on a traveling team and you were all over the place. Are you still, do you still have time for cycling with owning all those restaurants and you have a child and everything else? <laughs> Uh, yeah, it's more like bike riding now, uh, (laughs) here and there, you know, with the kids, we, you know, we go to the park or something like that, or, um, but yeah, cycling is not definitely not part of my daily life as it, like it used to be. But when you were young, did you have a vision of being like Lance Armstrong or was this more just a (laughs) casual fun thing? Or were you traveling around the world with your bike and, and, you know, in races and competitions? It was more like a Northeast kind of thing. Uh, You know, I was a young teen and, uh, you know, my family uh, being Colombian, uh, you know, cycling's big in Colombia. And so there was a lot of cycling going on, a lot of different family members that were part of it, my little brother, my, my, my father. So um, I, I I honestly wasn't very good um, as a cyclist. I I was on a team. I had my, I had my value. I was a good, uh, like a lead out guy. I could hold the pace for a long time. Um, but you know, I wasn't specific, you know, especially good at sprints or, or, uh, or, or mountain climbing or anything like that. But, uh, I was a lead out guy. I was just kind of a worker in the team. Cause you know, cycling is kind of a team sport when you're in a team and you're kind of in the middle of the peloton. And, uh, so, uh, you know, I was just a worker B, uh, I, I never really had any, uh, visions of becoming like a professional cyclist. I just, I really enjoyed the sport. I really enjoyed like the the kind of craziness of it, the torture of it. Like it was just, uh, it, it was, it was great. It, it definitely developed me as a person, had a lot of influence of who, who I am as a person, definitely. Uh, cycling. Well, before we go on to your next thing, I have to ask them because one of the big things a lot of people did during the pandemic was get a Peloton. And obviously <laughs> that's, that's cycling. Did you also fall into that? Did you buy a Peloton or yes or no? Well, so, you know, since we used to train a lot and in the winter we train indoors, we, we would always have our own bikes hooked up to, you know, to a roller or hooked up to a, uh, so, so, so you're kind of riding your own bike, but you're still experiencing the resistance and stuff like that. So I, I still have one of those. I never really just bought like the Peloton bike. Right? So basically you were ahead of the Peloton. Just for the rest game. of the, we thought about it for the rest of the family. And then I went online and I saw that it was like, like 10 months out, like for a delivery. And we were just kind of discouraged at that point. All right, very cool. So the next one is also something from your childhood. You were big into chess, right? Did you, were you also in chess competition? Yeah, I was on, I was on the chess team growing up. It's a real, real popular thing to be when, 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 when you're, <laughs> when you're in a school in, in Manhattan, but we, uh, you know, I, Chess was also big in my family, my father, my uncles, everybody was into chess. And so, um, yeah, I was, I was part of the, the chess team when I was good. I was pretty good. And I, you know, I, I had a U.S. Uh, United States Chess Federation ranking. I would go around playing, you know, with the clock and sometimes speed chess and sometimes, uh, you know, different tournaments and stuff. And then, you know, as I got older, I got away from the, the competitive chess, but I, uh, I still play. And uh, it had been a few years since I had played because I've been so busy. And then just recently I got into, you know, a few people wanted to challenge me and play and I I found out I still got it. So it's still worked out pretty good. So you represented and won. You held up that, uh, whatever that title is that you earned. (laughs) Yeah. Yes. Okay. All right. So this is interesting. Um, Since opening Toro, you became, uh, what is it? It's called a Mezcal aficionado. And the funny thing is, in preparing for this interview, I Googled what that was, and I came back with, it was a cigar, but it is not a cigar, and I was very wrong. So tell me what it means to be a Mezcal aficionado and what you've done with that. So Mezcal is kind of like the, the original tequila, right? It's, uh, it's, it's made from agave plants. Now, tequila itself has to be from a certain part of Mexico, and it has to be from the blue, uh, uh, blue, agave, blue Weber agave. 
Um, that has to be for tequila. But all mezcals can be from any any agave. Um, some plants that are eight years old, some plants that are 25 years old. Um, so depending on the kinds of agave, there's so many different kinds of varietals of agave out there. So it gets really kind of in depth trying to figure out, you know, what, what plant it was and where it came from. And no two mezcals are the same because every plant was, uh, came from a different area and it yielded this many bottles. Um, so um, mezcal uh, tends to be a little bit smoky because of uh, the way the, uh, the pulp is, is cooked. Uh, it's cooked over over uh, over fire, so it, it develops a nice smokiness. Versus uh, the mash for a tequila doesn't do that, so it's, it's similar to like you know scotch, how scotch is you know smoked over cooked over peat moss and gets that smokiness. Mezcal does the same thing, except mezcal typically doesn't get aged in any barrels or anything like that. It's really just about the plant, where it came from, and how old it was. Um, so. As you get into it, you start tasting all the different plants and uh, what they yielded from what region and what and what distiller. So it it just it, it, it's really uh it's really interesting uh, and and it's also you know one of the few things that I drink that doesn't give me a hangover. So when, <laughs> so when I do drink, if I do drink, I love to drink mezcal. Can you close your eyes and taste it and tell what kind of plant it's from? Um, I'm getting a lot better at it. Um, I can definitely, you know, tell like an Espadín away from, uh, 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 aside from like a, a Barril or a Karwinski. So I, I, I have developed a little bit of a palate for it, yeah. Okay. I am completely alcohol ignorant. So all of that goes right <laughs> over my head. But I just, I find it very interesting when people have that expertise that they can taste and tell and, and kind of identify. So it's very cool. All right. Your next one. You, I don't know how you had time to do this, running all the restaurants, you're back in the kitchen and everything else, you're promoting the restaurants, but you took up camping, right, with friends. <laughs> and I saw a few of these posts on Instagram and, and Facebook, but how did you get into that? So, you know, we, we, we came into the COVID year and it was a little crazy because, you know, every, we kind of went to takeout and that meant, you know, a lot of work, but like the operation kind of kind of got simplified, if you if you will, right? Not not a ton of employees, you know. You know we're back up to like 160 employees, I think now. But you know, we were down to just four managers and stuff like that, and we weren't doing this whole seven day a week thing. So there was some time off. All of us had a little bit of extra time, and uh, and but you know, there was no traveling. Uh, there was no you know, anything like that. So we were we kind of looked inward and said, well, what, what can we do locally that'll be fun and one of the family members, uh, one of our family members had gotten a trailer and we went and rented one just to go with them. And we kind of liked it. We rented a travel trailer and it was, they, they dropped it. It was easy because they dropped it off, took care of it for us and picked it up. You know, it, you know, it wasn't all the hard work of doing it yourself, but we got, you know, we got the bug that time. And then we went, we got a travel trailer and now we're, we're doing the camping thing. It's, it's been a lot of fun. And we realized that, you know, those campgrounds, the nicer ones, you know, with all the facilities and the safety for the kids to run around and do what they want. And all the family member kids and the cousins, they all run around and ride bikes and go to the pool and go to the game room. And so it's a world I discovered that I didn't really know anything about and never really saw myself doing at all. And now I'm just um, hooking up the travel trailer to the, to the truck and taking it, you know. <laughs> Wait, so now you own one. You went from renting to now you own your own? Yeah. Oh, so you got hardcore into it. And do you, you slip the tequila in the bag when you go? <laughs> Definitely mezcal on the, on the camping trips. And then, okay. <laughs> you know, we, we, we go on camping. There's like five or six uh, travel trailers that go along. You know, it's a whole family thing now. It's going to, you know. Uh, yeah, I just feel like there's like a lot of bugs and peeing in the woods. I, I can't get into it, but I know it's very popular. And I, and I know it obviously gained in popularity the, the last couple of the It was, it was of great though, the last it was great there. Definitely. It felt, felt right. You know, it felt kind of like you were out in the open air, no masks, not worrying about things. Um, Definitely. We'll, we'll see how it goes in the next couple of years, you know. All right. So when you weren't on the road camping and you weren't sniffing tequila, you were at home making your house technologically kind of all <laughs> hooked up, right? Throughout the whole house. How did you learn how to do this? And what's the best part of having a, a connected home? I, I just, I don't know. I like figuring things out. So it, I went down a rabbit hole with it and I'm like, oh, I can, you know, I can hook up, I can turn on my car from this thing and I can, you know, I can uh, set every room, every lamp, every TV, every, uh, you know, 
we can set the thermostat. I rewired the thermostat to be able to do it from from our Alexa. So we got we got a uh, the whole place is just rigged, you know, <laughs> to the we, dangers. <laughs> did you just say you could turn your car on? Yeah. <laughs> oh, you did. Okay. Well, yeah, you could you could just know. you could warm up your car by just telling Alexa to warm up your car. Okay, that, that cool I didn't things know you Alexa could do with it. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, I was yeah. going to ask you what's the coolest thing that you've done with the Alexa while kind of wiring your house, but I don't know if it's cooler than cooking up your or turning your car on, or is there? Is there yeah, something I think that was that? The, that's one of the best features, yeah. All right. Well, very cool. Amy, thank you so much for joining us. Obviously, I know New York is back to full capacity in restaurants. There's still the limitations, but if if I'm my colleague Steve Barnes gave me a little tip that you have the most restaurant space, most dining space, right? You have a capacity of 280 people. So you're back there at Toro. You're back there. Prime is obviously not small either in your other restaurants. So I'm glad you guys are back. You said that you're up to more than 100 employees now, right? So it's it's nice to, to see things kind of coming back and, and business, you know, running once again. So thank you again for joining us. Um, and obviously your restaurants, like I said, do both takeout and dine in. And then everybody can check out the regular list of 20 things you don't know about me each Monday at 7 a.m. on timesunion.com. Thanks again, Jamie. Thanks so much, Christy.